One, two, three. Ah, oh, perfect. Story time. Um, one of my most memorable athlete experiences was perhaps one where I failed the earliest on. Uh, there was this guy that walked into the gym and he was chatting with me about how he had never really been able to stick to a workout program, was looking for some extra coaching, was looking to be able to hit his goals finally. Um, and so what we did was our first month really keyed in on, hey, how are we moving? Make sure consistency is there. Make sure that the weights are progressing. I was like, man, I got you. This is going to be awesome. And, you know, he had said he was really excited about gaining muscle and losing fat. And so I was like, okay, we are on the same page. I saw him every day of the week, Monday through Friday. He was super consistent. So I was like, this is a slam dunk. Like we have never done better. No problem. It was easy money. So <clears throat> we get to our first month check-in and I put him on our in-body scanner. I mean, everything went according to plan. He had gained muscle. He had lost fat. And I think a pretty significant amount. And he sits back down and I was like, oh my gosh, we, I was like giving myself high five. Yeah. Like everything was awesome. I was like, this guy's about to <laughs> one, sing my praises. One compliment at a time, <laughs> True, please. Stop it, sir. stop it, stop it. <laughs> but he sits down and he was like, hey, so uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and quit. I don't think this is the right fit for me. And I was like, oh, okay, what? And we got into this conversation and it turned out that he was really looking for a group of people and a social interaction and a new set of friends. And after that conversation, he was like, yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and put him in my two weeks notice. I'm, I'm going to go try something else. And I was like, and I think that I felt like I had just been slapped in the face of just like cold water hitting me almost. And I walked away from that interaction thinking almost like mad at him, right? Mm. Because what he had communicated at the very beginning I nailed or I felt like I nailed and it turned out that what he was saying wasn't actually what he was looking for. Mm. And so a little bit deeper digging, I knew, okay, I didn't ask the right questions at the very beginning because what I should have been doing instead of making sure it was a perfect progression and making sure all of his weights were right, I should have been introducing him to people in the gym and introducing him to different class times that are more social than the others mm -hmm. so that he felt like he had a place and a home. And I had not been doing that. So it was this very realization of, hey, I've got to get out as early as possible the real reason why people are here. Because most will say they want to look some version of being better, whether that's muscle mass or weight loss or whatever. But he was one that I was so frustrated with, but also changed the way I interact with my athletes at the very beginning. Because I realized if I don't have the actual reason as to why people are here, I will not know how to motivate them or be their coach. Mm. Great job, Thanks. man. You nailed it. Who are you? Uh, my name is Brittany Rice. Brittany, how long have we been coaching together? So long. So honestly. long. Honestly, I've known you for a hot minute, but it's been four and a half years at BPR. Isn't that nuts? It is nuts. And what an honor it has been. Uh, I think very highly of you. Do you know that? Thank you. You know that. Thank you. One of the, um, I believe, innate skill sets that you possess is the ability to ask great questions. Uh, and also, I like to describe you as someone that doesn't suffer fools, which is a way, uh, it's, a, it's a compliment. It's a nice way of saying I was that. I about to say, hold on there. <laughs> that you can, you, you do a great job of waiting through the BS that a lot of times accompanies all of us as we're trying to be better, as we're trying to do this thing called fitness and health. And so we thought it would be really cool, uh, much like Chance last week, just to have a, a conversation that is being filmed um, that we often have around, man, where people's motivations lie, uh, some of the root causes that we need to address for why people are here just as you shared in that story um, if there's a if there's a chance to get into um, body image or self-esteem I think that would be helpful because I I believe you have a really healthy perspective on that and then hopefully the the takeaway for coaches who are listening to this 
are, as you mentioned, better questions to ask, and then what to do with the answers to those questions, which sometimes we know aren't the answers that need to be had in those questions. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot. It's a lot. We're going to hit on all of it. But where do you want to start? If, if we're making this for the coach that hasn't had some of the experiences that you've had and you wanted to walk them through what you see when it comes to, let's start with, with body image. Let's mm-hmm. talk about social comparison. Yeah. What are some of the perspectives that you have on that? With comparison, there's so much there. There's so much that's attached to how we live our lives, what we see every day, who we interact with. And I think that it's really easy to get caught up in what's happening around you. Mm. And I would say that oftentimes what people come to us for is a reaction to something that's happened in that space. Mm. And so They've compared their self to someone. They see something that they want or they see something that they don't want. And that is driving the reason that they walk into a space like ours. And it's really easy to capitalize off of motivation like that. I can take that as a coach and run with it of, oh, you want to lose weight? Great. Let's roll. I know how to provide that. But so much of it also is, I think motivation can waver really quickly. Mm -hmm. And if I don't have a better reason behind comparison as to why we are doing this at all, Mm -hmm. I think that the actions that will follow will probably start to differ. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that the problem with body image is with food and nutrition and stuff like you can't avoid it. You have to eat. It's not like an addiction, like to your phone or to Instagram where you can just delete the app. And so it's a problem that we all have to deal with. And I would say that most of the time with body image of all the people that I've worked with, I've worked with people that are 300 pounds overweight and people that are about to walk onto a stage for a bodybuilding competition. And everyone has something with their body that they want to change there is never an arrival point. Hmm. I think that people don't realize that. Hmm. And so I don't think body image or being like cured of body image or not struggling with body image is this arrival point of now I love my body every day and I wake up and I just want to look in the mirror all day because I feel awesome. It's more of a, I just don't want to have to overthink, okay, how am I going to sit at the pool? Because I know that my stomach looks a certain way. Am I going to hate getting up and getting dressed in the morning because my jeans don't fit right? So I think that's more so of just like, hey, how do I think about my body less versus, hey, I'm perfectly happy with my body every single day. Yeah. Man, that's a great point uh, because I think that we put we put those people that, that we see on social media and even those that potentially we're exercising around and we say, man, if I could just look like that, my life would be like this. Mm-hmm. If I can just get to a point where – I'm there, then I don't have any problems. Yes. I think unchecked. There's so much that they attach to how they look externally. And if you think about it, though, like I know those influencers. I know a lot of them. They do not have the lifestyle that you want. Mm-hmm. And truly, I, like, <laughs> I have an experience Their life like that. kind of yeah. sucks. Yeah, it's honestly, you not don't kinda. want that. Their life sucks. Right. I, I mean, truly, I've, like, stepped into that. Like, I've, like, tracked macros and done all this stuff, and I hated it. Mm-hmm. It was awful. And so that wasn't a good fit for me. <laughs> Might be a good fit for others. Not not dogging on that. But it was something where, you know, with certain physiques, you have to give up a lot. And so I think that they see that, like, oh, my problems will be fixed. But then as far as their lifestyle of what they want to create, they think that these – influencers or even just these like elite athletes are living a very similar lifestyle, but they're just getting totally different results. Mm -hmm. And so they think, Oh, I'm still going to be able to, you know, go out with my friends on the weekends. Like enjoy my life. Yeah. Just like be a happy camper, Uh get to travel. And, (laughs) and that's not the case. And so that's what even, it makes me laugh so hard when uh, girls come in here and they're like, Oh, I don't want to get too bulky or I don't want to like, you know, be too muscular. 
like, do you know the amount of effort it takes to look like that? And so I think that so many times, yeah, just the expectations of what comes with a certain physique is totally off. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great point. This is a great point for us just personally. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great point for us as coaches, not to, not to like jam that in somebody's face, Mm -hmm. but to hold on to that very gently that this process that they're going through of, of initially comparing, it's probably a natural aspect of being a human being, right? Mm -hmm. We have others to evaluate where we're at. We, we can't really avoid that. But much like anything, there's, there's just a point where you have to really tease that out Mm -hmm. to say, what is it that you're saying that you really want? And, you know, maybe, maybe one of those great questions is, do you think that by being, uh, with lower body fat that you're not going to have any problems in your life? Do you think Mm -hmm. you're going to be able to eliminate suffering from your life? With, I think there's a, there's a disconnect because with a certain body style or certain aesthetic that people look towards, we think, you know, yes, we will eliminate all suffering from our lives. That is when my life will be perfect. That's when my life will be easy because I like what I see in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And they don't take into account all the other things that change in your lifestyle because of that. So, so much of when I'm coaching people, it's not even a, Hey, this is what your nutrition should look like. And this is what your workout plan should look like. I really ask the question of what do you want it to look like? What do you want your relationship with fitness to be? What do you want your relationship with nutrition to be? Because us as coaches know what it takes, the input that it takes to get certain physiques and the input it takes to make your life look a certain way. But if they're not wanting their life to look like that, then it's our job to bridge the gap of what results that actually creates. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's like a precision nutrition thing where it shows like, hey, if you want this percent body fat, this is kind of what your life looks like. And I've sat down with so many people and especially girls, but guys have it too, where I'll ask them instead of inputting, Hey, this is what you should be doing for nutrition. We should be doing a, B and C and, you know, cooking all of our things from home and eating as you know raw as you can or whatever. I just ask him, Hey, what do you want your relationship with food to look like? Mm-hmm. Because a lot of people would say, Hey, I still want to be able to go out to eat a couple times a week. I want to be able to eat the dessert at birthday parties. I want to be able to not think about if I can have a glass of wine with my steak And for those things, I'm listening for, okay, this is a lifestyle that they want to be a part of what's happening with them. Now, if they think that they are going to look like the figure competitor that's about to step on stage, that's where my work begins to be able to align expectations with what the actual output is going to be. Mm -hmm. So I hear you saying that there's a a difference in, because some people are saying like, I won't be happy until I'm perfect. Mm Mm-hmm. And what I hear you saying is let's zoom out. Let's look at all the things that have to be there for this thing that you want. And do you want these things with that? Mm -hmm. And another way of saying that is instead of perfection, it's satisfaction. What, What will you be satisfied in this whole system of things that have to be present? Mm -hmm. And if you're not satisfied with these things, then we probably shouldn't expect that to be the desired outcome. Yeah. And if we're really looking for something that they will pursue for a long period of time, there has to be this aspect of, I feel emotionally satisfied at the end of every day. Mm. If you feel like you have deprived yourself all day and you've you know done stuff that you hated all day, but you're working towards this goal, that goal is not going to be very satisfactory. Like maybe for a season where you know, I did this really hard challenge and I reached this goal, but now I go immediately back to something else. But it's so important to know how do you want your life to look and how do you want, and that plays into all different aspects of things. And even what we've been been dabbling in coaching is what do you want your relationships to look like? What do you want your relationship with food to look like? What do you want your relationship with fitness to look like? And then be able to coach them towards that, but also set up realistic expectations of, hey, if you are really intent on, like I have an athlete that he's like, hey, I want to go out and party with my friends every Saturday night. I'm like, great. If that's something that's really important to you, 
we can make that happen, but you need to know what that affects the rest of the week. And you mm-hmm. need to know how that affects your results so that when we sit down together, it isn't a mismatched expectation. Mm-hmm. Or even uh, that's, you know, you want to be social with your friends. That's great. But here are the ways that we have to compensate for that. Or mm-hmm. here are the ways that we have to adjust the the expectations. Exactly. Do you have any trouble keeping people ambitious? Because I'm sure most of the time when when you're sharing this, it's almost like a little letdown or, or like a reality check. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, shit. Oh, oh, yeah, I didn't really even think about that. Mm-hmm. So how do you maintain this really delicate balance of opening someone's eyes to the reality of what this is, but also keeping them disciplined and not just, you know, um, accepting mediocrity so they yeah. can enjoy their life. Yeah. I would, I would say I find the most success. I, I don't have a problem with optimism and wanting big goals. I think that that's what most people come in with. Hmm. And it's really been interesting to see my job has almost been pulling the reins back on people and creating such minuscule tasks and minuscule goals that it almost feels like they didn't even try to get there. Mm. And that's been the most measure of success over a long period of time versus the person that comes in and they've been eating McDonald's three times a day for the past three months. And then all of a sudden they want to do macros. Yeah. And so I think that it's, it's not a bad thing to want really big goals, but my job has been, okay, I want that for you. The reality of that is that takes a year. Let's talk about what we're going to do for the next month Mm -hmm. and creating really small steps to make sure we're headed in that direction, but to not feel like you've failed if it didn't happen in a month. So I think I have been the bearer of bad news in a lot of ways, and I have been the person that's had to give the reality check. But I would say in our space with fitness, it's almost a breath of fresh air because everything is promising crazy results in 90 days and a totally different life in 60 days. Mm. And so I think it's almost a, oh, you're willing to tell me the truth that this is going to be longer than I thought. It is way more underwhelming than we thought it was going to have to be, but I can stick with it for a long period of time. Yeah. And so I think that that's, that's really good. That's been more of my experience with those that have been successful. Let's switch gears and and talk about, you know, instead of those that come in with huge amounts of optimism and big audacious goals. You start to work with someone and you, you catch whiffs of not uh, unrealistic expectations for what they want to accomplish, Mm -hmm. but you see that they have a really unhealthy view of themselves. Like Mm -hmm. instead of somebody coming in and they're, you know, morbidly obese, like somebody comes in and it's that opposite extreme. It's like, man, you're, you're asking for these big audacious things, but you're, you're actually already really healthy. And Mm -hmm. so you catch these whiffs of, um, maybe a a disturbance, maybe a distortion in how they see themselves. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that, that you're thinking, even just personally, um, and what are some of the things that you're thinking as a coach? Yeah, when people have a very skewed view of themselves that doesn't show up physically, Mm -hmm. there's always a story there. There's always something that is attached to that. And I think that goes back to kind of what we've been talking about is asking the right questions early on. Mm -hmm. I think that in the first time meeting someone, and even it comes out over and over again, um, if you'll meet with them pretty consistently and have real conversations whatever it is that has caused this skew comes up pretty quickly. And so it might not be this, you know, I feel overweight, but I'm not actually overweight, but there is something in their life that told them that over and over and over again. And that is usually the thing that they are either running from or running towards whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, But oftentimes it all goes back to emotions and feelings around it. Something caused this really big feeling around either body image or the way that they consume food or, you know, the way they interact with people and they have created this persona and it's been told over and over again in their head so much so that they believe it. And now that has become truth in their life, Hmm. even though nothing 
as far as proof would say that that is actually the case. But I think that in those scenarios, when I sit down with someone and they are radically different mindset than I would assume, mm-hmm. um, I think that the questions start to change of, hey, where do we get that? What does that mean to you? What are you actually saying whenever you say that, you know, you're way out of shape mm-hmm. and you're be- in better shape than probably 80 percent of the population? And the sooner I can get to whatever heartstring got plucked and stayed there, the easier it is to figure out, hey, why are you actually here? What do you mean by heartstrings? Yeah. So uh, heartstrings was something that I uh, learned early on in my fitness career was we're always driven by emotions. We're always driven by our feelings. And most of the goals that people come with, if you do not have a deeper personal reason driving what you're actually doing, then oftentimes it feels like it falls on deaf ears. And so I would say most everyone wants to get in shape or lose weight or do all these things, but no one's actually emotionally attached to that. So when it comes down to doing hard things, they don't stick with it. But those that are driven by some sort of heart string, so literally attaching your heart to your habit, um, they're the ones that have a little bit deeper meaning to it. So for example, I have an athlete He uh, has been one of the most consistent people in the gym. He very rarely cares if he PRs on a lift. He very rarely cares about uh, learning new skills. But he became a grandfather recently. And so for him, his ultimate goal in life and what he's really attached to and what his heart is attached to is being a really good grandfather and Mm. being able to teach him how to play catch and hold him as he's a toddler and throw him around in the pool and all this stuff. And so for him, that means if he's created this picture that he's really emotionally attached to now all of his actions around it start to make sense because it's pursuing this thing that he's really emotionally attached to Mm -hmm. so whether he's going to come in the gym every day is not a question he absolutely vitally has to do that because he's so emotionally attached to where he's headed so i would say attaching a heartstring is really peeling back the layers of why am i doing this in the first place and that's what i try to get to with anyone i chat with is why are we actually doing this past the things that you always hear? Mm -hmm. Because that's what I can actually work with. And that's what I can actually use as motivation when the idea of being skinnier is not fun. And so as you start to uncover this and you're, you're getting to the identity piece and the real thing that has some type of juice to it, what do you do when you, get to a place where you realize like, oh man, that heartstring is not going to carry you through this. So, you know, I, I keep bringing up body image because Mm -hmm. I think it's something that we all know exists, but we don't really talk about, Mm -hmm. or we just kind of sweep under the rug. You get to a point where someone says, I, I don't know. I, I don't, like the way that I look and you realize like, man, as you said, there's a lot of stories that have been reinforced Mm -hmm. and you're, you're, you're getting to the root cause of this sweet person across from you that you realize has put on a pedestal, something that isn't going to go well for them. And I know that's a tough question. You may not have an answer, but what do you do? Yeah, I think, When someone is deep in the weeds of body image, a lot of times creating goals around that feels like another person telling them that they're not as they should be. Mm. That's so good. And so I would say that with, you know, there's, there's a fine line between motivating someone and just being a human being. I think that oftentimes coaches go into a interaction with someone that is asking for their help and... They're looking to be the solver of the problem. And I would say that most everyone that this person has reached out to is trying to solve the problem for them. And oftentimes, especially with body image, because it's so convoluted and because it's so personal and because it's something that they have to deal with every day, a lot of times just being able to reframe their mindset and being able to be a sounding board of, hey, this is why this started to come up for me. Was that actually true? 
what does that look like now? What are the ways that we can think about our body positively? If it's not the way that it looks, well, let's talk about all the ways that your body, you know, performs for you, or let's look at all these different ways where, and so I think that oftentimes, you know, I look back to those that have struggled with body image a lot. The goals have not been around, let's lose this amount of weight. The goals have not been around, you know, let's look the certain way or let's like find this one pair of jeans that you want to fit in. But it's truly been a, hey, what is something that your body does for you that you're thankful for? What's cool, Britt, is I have seen that happen with your clients. And we won't mention any names, <laughs> but you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Where we've seen, you know, somebody come in and it, it just reeks. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, oh, man, we, we know what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And you have gently graciously and patiently expanded what they're proud of, mm -hmm. which is beautiful. It really is something that because this is the body you're working with, there is a realization of, hey, this is what we've got right now. Mm -hmm. And there is an aspect of let's steward this well. What does that look like today? And what does that look like this week? And over time, if we can start to treat our body well, then you will get the results that you didn't even realize you needed. Mm -hmm. And I think that with that, we get to take our coaching hat off and kind of put our like teammate hat on mm -hmm. of, okay, I don't necessarily need to be the guide right now. I need to be the safe space. And if you can create that for your people, then they are much more willing to one, tell you about that heartstring. Cause what I've learned is also, you know, we're talking about all this like touchy feely stuff. No one's going to like weep with you the first time you see them. Mm -hmm. Right. It takes some emotional capital there mm -hmm. or relational capital, I guess. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of, Hey, let's get back to the root. Let's get back to the root. Let's get back to the root. But most people are not prepared to share that with you. Mm -hmm. And so it does take patience. And so what we are saying sounds all pretty and nice, but if you were to walk into a first interaction with someone and be like, all right, well, tell me the deepest, darkest reason as to why you hate your body. Probably not going to be great. <laughs> Thank you so much for asking. Yes, exactly. They're like, I've been dying to tell yeah, someone. I was, I was hoping you'd lead with that. <laughs> yes, yes. So I think it takes a lot of patience. I think that it also, they are not, they probably have not looked at that. They have not probably dug deep into why that's happening. Mm-hmm. And so the right questions, but also being able to acknowledge like, hey, this is a sensitive subject for someone. So maybe it's not shared on the first time. Mm -hmm. But every time that we if I get that whiff of like, man, it's it's written all over you that we've got a skewed view of something. That's kind of what I keep digging on every time I get to have an interaction with them is a little bit more of what's driving this a little bit more of, you know, what interaction told you this so that then we can also start to look at it from you're no longer the 10 year old girl that got bullied. Like, okay, now that we're in our thirties, let's look, was that another 10 year old that was being a punk? Yes. Was there any sort of like truth in this? No. Mm. Can we maybe let that go and look at all these things that our body can do for us now? Let's see what that feels like. Yes. And I think this is a great segue to go from the, the why, or, you know, being very realistic about, people aren't coming in as robots and be like, hey, just, you know, eat this stuff and do these exercises. Yeah. We, we did it. <laughs> and now transitioning into, okay, what are the protocols? Somebody's listening to this that is mm -hmm. coaching and they their eyes have been open. They're like, yeah, you know what? They're right. Uh, people do come in probably on some sliding scale. We all come in with with some skewed perspective of what we'll feel like when we actually accomplish these results. Mm -hmm. But you've said a lot of things that I want to break down and, and come away with like a, a great checklist, a great protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, and so let's get into some of the questions that we ask or even just maybe the process that we would go through. Yeah. Um, you're sitting down with somebody, and I'll try to be like the color commentary for, oh, cool. for this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what, are, what are some great questions that you like to ask? And then, because I think the, the three-step process is, you know, one, we need to, if we're talking about thoughts, hey, let's, let's identify what those are. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they are unless you actually say them. Right. Um, and then from there, as you've mentioned, um, I mean, we have, to, we have to change 
what that language is mm -hmm. around that. Mm -hmm. And that's probably where we can spend a lot of time. You had mentioned like, hey, this is where we're at, yeah. which is another way of saying, hey, let's just accept like what's reality. And then, you know, we're taking this thing that that's saying, this is who I am and I don't like it to just saying like, hey, it's just like one, it's just one thing, yeah. it's just one data point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your body fat's high. That doesn't mean you're a piece of shit as a human being. So I, you let's let's failed. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's let's look at this process through identifying the negative thoughts, changing that language, and then lastly, uh, maybe challenging that, mm -hmm. and then changing or crafting like what it's going to be. Does yeah. that sound? Does yeah, that sound sounds fair? great. Yeah. So I would say, sitting down with someone, your job is to again kind of start to dig for that heartstring. It's to get a little bit deeper knowledge into why they're sitting down with you because they made the effort, right? You didn't go out and get them. So they're not reluctantly like shuffling in. I would say that oftentimes my protocol is to get them talking. And so it sounds so dumb, but I just ask him like, Hey, why are you here? Uh -huh. And where they take that makes it really easy for me. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people are, you know, give the very generic answer of, oh, I've tried a lot of working out and I want to work out in this space instead. And I tend to, it's called, you know, the five whys. And it's more of a just like, hey, tell me why this place instead of somewhere else. Okay, tell me why that feels like the right call. Okay, tell me why this is the thing. Mm -hmm. And asking those open-ended questions. So that's one tactic to be able to start to open up what's happening. Um, I think that if I can get them telling a story of I'll, I'm listening through, you know, I've done this and I've done this and I've done this and, you know, all these things haven't worked for me. I start to cue in on these certain things that they are saying over and over again. I'm like, okay, well, you've said nothing's worked for you. What do you mean nothing's worked for you? Why do you think that is? And just get them starting to process through why they think, because as a coach, you can really easily be like, oh, well, this is just because you are not A, B, and C, and you can be the provider of the answer. But I have found it so much better and sticks so much better if they can come to the answer on their own. Mm, so that's really good. it's the motivational interviewing, mm -hmm. I would say, is I have something I'm trying to get you to. And I actually don't know what it is yet. I know it's something that's highly emotional to you as to driving most of your actions right now. But the questions that I come away with are often start with why, mm -hmm. just to leave it open-ended. I would say that I try to put them in a state where they have to tie into their emotions. So mm -hmm. say that everything went according to plan, everything you're saying that you want from me, I delivered on. In three months, how do you feel? What's different about your life in three months? Yeah. What can you do then that you weren't able to do now? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take it in a year. What can you do in a year that you cannot pursue right now. That's really good. And That's... so I remember there was a there was one of my guys that he was talking through, he had just gone through a divorce and he was like getting back out there for the first time and just like wanting to feel his most confident. Shooting a shot. Dude, he was going for it. And so it was so fun to get to walk through that with him. But what we discovered was he was like, oh, I'm doing all these things because I don't feel confident dating. And he was going on more dates than I've ever seen anyone. It was <laughs> awesome. He went for it, jumped in the deep end. <laughs> But I talked to him and he wasn't pursuing what we had said to do. I was like, hey, here are the things that we need to work on with nutrition. And here are the things we work on. And we had sat down after a couple months. And I was just like, hey, man, like, tell me a little bit more about why this keeps being a miss. And what he had stated was, hey, I feel like I'm missing out on feeling confident on dates. So I feel like I'm not going on dates because I feel like my body doesn't look like it should. And what we learned was that he feels fine going on dates. That was not the problem. And so we learned that what he thought his heartstring was, it wasn't because it he wasn't actually missing out on anything. So we got to then redig. And so I think that with attaching an emotional reason behind it, it's easy to try to be like, oh, that's for sure it. Or, oh, okay, that's the reason why. Mm -hmm. And it just takes some time with people. But as far as your question of, okay, let's talk through from start to finish, I would say, ask them why they're there, get them talking, ask them why that's important to them. Ask him what will be different. Mm -hmm. Ask them how it feels once they get to the place that they're saying that they want to go. And those are great places to start to get them to talk through 
And you'll usually start to see a theme that starts to come up. Mm -hmm. And then as you start to see, oh, I've always been self-conscious or I've always not been confident or I've always been this. Okay, tell me about a little bit about mm -hmm. that type of confidence. Why do you feel that is? Yeah, yeah, so good. The, the big question of w three months from now, everything happens. In therapy, that's called the miracle question. Mm. You wake up and everything that you possibly could hope for happened. How is your life different? And what I hear you saying is that you're you're asking questions just to hear something that comes onto your radar is untrue, mm -hmm. right? And and what do we mean by untrue? It doesn't mean that you know theologically it's it's not in line with what you believe. It's just that it's a they have said something that's a value judgment instead of an objective fact. Mm -hmm. And so as coaches, we are. Uh, you, you mentioned motivational interviewing. There's there's specific criteria to that. It means that you're asking open-ended questions. Mm -hmm. It means that you are affirming what they say, and that doesn't mean that you're trauma bonding. And you know you're like, oh, you see, bless, bless your heart. heart. Yeah. yeah, you say, hey, I I could see how that would be hard. Um, whoa, that's a uh, that's a wild story. That's mm -hmm. that's affirming, right? Yeah. It, all it is saying is like, "Hey, I'm I'm listening to mm -hmm. you." And when someone gets that, it's very easy for them to continue to talk. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of uh, motivational interviewing is based on um, reflecting what it is that you hear them saying, and also summarizing, um, because sometimes you will hear something that you realize isn't an objective truth, it's a value judgment, and you'll need more clarity. Mm -hmm. And I bet you're the same as me oftentimes. But so, so when you said that, do you mean mm -hmm. that this is true? And, yeah, sometimes they'll say, like, no, no, no that's not what I meant. Yeah. Or they'll be like, yeah, that's absolutely what I mean. Yeah. And I've said this before, but what I love about this part of coaching is that I mean, you don't know where it's going to go, and you're not an architect, um, you know, with a puppet on a string like controlling this person. You're just digging. You're an archaeologist, and you're like, "Hey, I know there's going to be some, there's going to be something here in this big desert, but I don't really know where it is, and mm -hmm. so I'm just going to go for it." Yeah. But I, I think what you described is um, something that everyone, if they're patient enough, can emulate, mm -hmm. and. I remember when I first heard like the five whys or the, you know, Socratic method as it's called, I was like, this is stupid. Somebody's going to be like, why do you keep asking me why questions? Mm -hmm. But if you're, if you're deliberate enough and you really seem like you're listening, then it's very natural. Mm -hmm. It doesn't be like, well, why do you do that? Well, why is that true? Or why is that That's true? That's what I was about yeah. to say is truly if you just go, why? Like you sound like the seagull, like you can't just keep pecking at them, mm -hmm. it has to be a, okay, I heard this in your story. Why do you think that is? Yes. Okay, let's build on that. Okay, well, this is something that I just heard. Why do you think that is? It's it's a concept and a very simple framework that you think doesn't work, but it does work if it could just be, it's it's improv, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of no, but it's yes, and? Yeah. Ooh, what about Ooh. that? Oh, and tell me more. Mm -hmm. Oh, why did you say that? And then you get them basically painted into a corner where you've arrived at this, we'll call it like a sentence that is not doing them justice. Mm -hmm. What do you do at that point? At that point in time, I often, because most of the time those sentences come in blanket statements. Well, everyone thought I was this, mm. or this person thought this of me. Okay, And it's a lot of assumption, and it's a lot of, I created this story in my head. And so I will usually ask them, like, it's almost insulting to say, but it's like, hey, did every person actually say that to you? Mm -hmm. Or did that person vocalize that? Or when you felt dumb in this group, did they tell you that? Mm -hmm. And most times it's a no. It can be a yes. Like you said, it's improv. We don't know how that conversation is going to go. But I think giving some language around, hey, tell me, in actuality, facts. Mm -hmm. What does that sentence actually mean? Yes. It means that I interpreted that they thought something different of me, or I interpreted that 
this whole thing went to absolute crap. Mm -hmm. Those uh, these specifics, because I think it's important as you're listening to this as a coach, you're looking for words that increase the emotion always, never. Mm -hmm. Uh, also projections on, so, so the first one I would call dramatics, right? Mm -hmm. It's just words that we use to, when somebody hears it, my daughters do this too. <clears throat> oh man, she always does that to me. It's like, always? Okay, Quite yeah, literally yeah. always. Yeah, and it yeah. totally takes the wind out of their sails. Yeah. Like, okay, not, not always. Right. So that's one. Um, projections, right? She, she always does this to me. Mm -hmm. She? And then I, I think uh, statements of disbelief mm -hmm. could be a third category. I can't believe that after all these years, I'm still overweight. Yep. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. There's probably others, but I think, like, I think those three are, are yeah. ones that, that come up quite often. Yeah. I think that also when those like, I like to call, you know, the blanket statements, right? Where it's mm -hmm. like, it's a huge catch all. Mm -hmm. I like to, and a lot of my friends hate me for this, but I love to ask, okay, let's play it out. Like, let's say that that is true. What does that do for you? And that's so good. It's so funny because take notes. <laughs> that's so good. Pen and paper, people. Uh, but it's so funny to say, okay, like, and you know, we, I think anxiety is so much of like creating these stories in your head of what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And if you play it out, nothing bad actually happens. And so it's such a funny thing where I'm like, okay, walk me through if that happens. Like, if someone thought you were dumb, what happens? Mm -hmm. You just go on your life. Like they might think that. Are they going to say it to you? Are they going to like defame you in front of a large group of people? Are they going to like, like what are you afraid is going to happen if they thought you were dumb or they thought that you looked, if we're doing body image, they thought you looked bad in a swimsuit. Like nothing bad happens to you. If you will play out in your head, the worst case scenario is that I looked fat whenever I was sitting by the pool because my stomach looked a certain way. Like, okay. What happens if that is true? Nothing bad happened to you. Like, that was a story you create in your head. And also no one is actually thinking that you have created that. Like no one told you, Hey, you look bad. Mm -hmm. And no one gathered people to say, Hey, did everyone see that she looked bad? And so this story that you're creating in your head and this anxiety around how you're feeling and what you're looking like most of the time is internal. And so that's where oftentimes like with those statements, my next step is like, okay, let's play it out. What happens if that is true? Yeah. And there's so your superpower is getting someone to go from ruminating over something to emotionally processing something and ruminating is typically where we just replay over and over again this problem and we make it bigger and bigger and bigger and it's like okay i haven't actually really processed one how to accept it Two, how to do anything productive that would make me not feel this way. And three, to minimize what's going on to the smallest isolated incident. Mm -hmm. Because the previous and the thing that they probably have never thought about is just that this it's growing and, and it's bigger and it's bigger and it's bigger and people will laugh at me and I'll be humiliated and it means that I'm not just fat, but like I'm a pile of crap yeah, as a human I'm being. I'm an idiot. And this process that we're talking about is really trying to uh, accept what's going on mm -hmm. and then put it into perspective. I think that's a, a good way to say this. Like, hey, let's let's really let's really look at this objectively. And so as you start to challenge these thoughts, these sentences, this narrative that you're hearing, what is usually their response? defensive yeah yeah i think that and especially like because it's yeah. been this precious yes. precious thing that yeah. they have loved to sit oh, yes. and feel sorry for themselves yes. about mm -hmm. yes we uh we call it a tinder shoot mm. where a plant is just coming up out of the soil for the first time and if you if you overdo anything with it it's going to die but it's just this new tender thought this idea that they've been like sitting on and yeah, you have to gently care for that. You can't just come and like punch it down into the <laughs> ground and be like, that's dumb that you think that. But yeah, there's this aspect of like, hey, you're trusting me with something that's very vulnerable. So I want to handle that with care. 
But oftentimes it's, hey, if let's let's look at the magnitude that you've given such a small thing. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the first thing is defensive. But then if we can get past that, normally it's this like acceptance of like, oh, every scenario that I played out that I'm actually panicking about, none of that happened. And I'm actually just dealing with this one isolated incident or I'm actually dealing with this one small aspect of who I am. Mm-hmm. And that gives them a lot of freedom. If we can truly say, hey, you know, all the cases in which you over, you know, emphasize this are not actually happening right now. And we can just deal with this one aspect of it. Okay. Let's control our controllables now and see what, like, let's move into action That's steps so from good. there of, hey, can you actually control what people think of you? Can you actually control all these different things that now we are spinning out over? And the answer is no, right? And so most of us tend to spend most of our anxiety on things that we can't control. So now we get to get into the coaching aspect of what can we control and what are the things that we can do and now how can I hold you accountable to them? Yeah, it's so good, Britt, because everything that we've unpacked right now I believe is skipped Mm -hmm. and we just go to the prescription. Hey, just do this, do this, do this. Mm -hmm. And it means nothing, right? It means nothing to the person because it doesn't feel like it's, it's catered to who they are Mm -hmm. and it's not factoring in like the really deep scripts that are going through our head. And so once we, once we've done the, and this is a whole session, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, we, we hadn't talked about nothing but this, uh, what are some of those action steps? Like what, what are, what are ways that you will coach this, Mm -hmm. whether it's, it's cognitive and it's giving them different scripts that they might say in place of that. Hey, every time that you feel this way, I want you to say this all the way to different behaviors. Like, Mm -hmm. Hey, if you know, we've talked about like, if there's certain scenarios where these start to creep in more and more, here's what we'll do here. What would you do? Great question. I think that a lot of it depends on the person and totally. depends on where they're at with that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that action steps vary, but all that to say, I think that, okay, what are things we can control around, you know, body image or even just like putting yourself in certain situations? Hey, maybe this might not be the right time to be in this particular situation. And that's got to be okay. And maybe this is the right time to try to do this new thing. And so it's hard to put exactly what the action steps would be moving forward. But I think that with that person sitting in front of you, you can start to work with them of, okay, what would happen if you did this instead? How does that feel? Okay, what would happen if we did this instead? How does that feel? And... I think that so much of it, if it's collaborative, again, they're a lot more likely to stick to it. So even with the, okay, now it's prescription time. Mm -hmm. If you just slap on what you would do in that scenario, it doesn't actually help as much. And so I still move back to letting them create their own answers, basically. Um, So it's, you know, as a coach, that's not what you want. You want to hear, well, A plus B is going to equal C. Mm-hmm. But it's so convoluted when you're dealing with people's emotions and especially with things like fitness, nutrition, body image. And so there have been times where, hey, it might not be the best scenario to work out with this girl that always takes her shirt off and has an eight pack. Like, do you think that you could find a different class time so you're not just constantly looking at her yeah. and comparing yourself? Just drooling over Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, Do you think that it would be a good idea if you always, you know, if you find that you spiral into these negative actions once you've had alcohol, do you think it would be better to not drink alcohol tonight? Hmm. Like just little things like that. I think those are two like really easy, like lob ups, you know, it's not going to always be that easy, but I think that there are some ways that you can start to make steps towards, Hey, if these are negative emotions that come around this, if these are things that you are deeply struggling with and you want to get rid of. Here are some ways to in which we can start to combat that and tell ourselves truth as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really good. And it makes me think that in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, oh, yes. 
a lot of times you're asking questions of, hey, this thing that led to you feeling this way, what happened right before there? Mm. And I find that it's very easy to cast judgment on people, especially when they're going through something that you yourself may not have <sighs> experienced. That's real. And, you know, a lot of us, it's like that are that are coaching. Yeah, maybe we didn't, you know, grow up as Hercules, but at some point we did taste success. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy to, as you're sitting with someone, be like, hey, why can't you just do this thing? But I've found, and so, and from that, you would make assumptions that, well, they don't have the answer. This person's an idiot. Mm -hmm. But I found that if you ask the right questions, and especially if we're on this train of thought and their, their brain is thinking now more objectively and they're processing this, they have great answers to these questions. They do. And so asking that cause and effect question is, hey, when you felt this way, what happened like right before that? They typically have an answer. Mm -hmm. Hey, what do you think would be like the easiest thing you can do to take ground here? They typically have an answer. Yeah. And so instead of you once again having to be um, this mind reader, I think that if you can get them on this train of thought and their brain is now activated to this thing that we're talking about and you ask the right questions, all you have to do is scribe, you know, you have to be a stenographer just mm -hmm. to write down, okay, so you think step, okay, step one, you'll do this. What, what, what do you think step two is? Okay, you'll do that. Mm -hmm. All right. That's you what said you, you want to yeah. do this. Yeah. You said that. Yeah. I find Thank that you so much. I didn't do anything. I just wrote down what you said. Right. Yeah. And that's what, I mean, that's when it makes it so much easier with coaching and where compliance really like shoots through the roof, right? Because I didn't impose my ideas on them. Because mm -hmm. you're right. I have such a hard time with seeing things in black and white. I'm like, if you care about it, just do it. <laughs> yeah. And that's what my uh, mom's best friend from growing up, she basically like her motto was like, oh, if you cared enough, you would. And there's some truth to that where it's like, hey, if you care deeply enough about something happening, like you will make it happen. But now that we've gotten to the root of it, we know that they deeply care about this. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer like, oh, you just don't have it or you just aren't motivated enough or whatever. Like now we've gotten to the root of why they're actually doing the things that they're doing or why they are avoiding the things they're avoiding. And so there is a deep connection to it. Mm -hmm. Now the action steps should be easy to play forward. That it's like, hey, you told me that you wanted to do this. And that's where you can repeat back to when you meet with them again is it doesn't have to be this like, hey, you're coming into the principal's office because, again, you didn't do what I told you to do. It's like, hey, you told me that you were really excited about these. So you tell me why we didn't act on them. And or if it is, then great. We get to celebrate with them. That's probably a great place to land the plane mm. is, man, we've had this great interaction and then they still make mistakes. Yeah. How do you how do you coach through that? Totally. They say all these things. Yeah. And and hey, we get there. You, yeah. you wrote it. Yeah. And and they make a mistake or or they're not perfectly adherent. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you handle that? That's a great question. I think that we have to acknowledge that people change and people evolve. And so I would say that what was important to me five years ago is not as important to me now. You don't say. Oddly enough. Yeah. And so we have to constantly be going back to, hey, is this important to you? Is this what's driving us right now? Great. If it's not, let's do this exercise again. Like, and it doesn't have to be this like overly overwhelming, like deep, you know, thing that's been tender their whole life. That's, and not, that's what I like to do. Yeah, there I like, you go. Everybody gets smoked yeah. when they sit down with me. Everybody cries. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Tear ducts just empty. <laughs> But no, I think that when they don't adhere, that means that either they weren't tied to it or we didn't get to the actual thing that's driving them. Mm -hmm. So I would say that you don't necessarily have to go back to the drawing books, but if the actions don't follow, and you've said this to me plenty of times, like either it was too big of an ask or it wasn't the right ask. And so what are the things that we need to reshape to where it's either they don't see that these actions are going to get them to where they want to be or it felt too overwhelming, so they went back to what was comfortable. And I think that's more realistic than people realize that we write stuff down and we we come up with this prescription for them, but that's where it starts. It's mm -hmm. not where it stops. Mm -hmm. And it's this iterative process where it's like, let's try this. How did you do? Okay, you didn't do it. Either it's one or the other, right? Just like you said. 
And then that's where we step in with the experience and say, okay, well, let's let's make this smaller. Let's make the the cadence or the frequency different. Hey, let's even change the focus instead of this thing. Who cares about that? Now let's focus there. And that's what's so freeing about having so many methods to work on recovery and stress management and nutrition and exercise. And it makes me think of even when my kids make mistakes, mm-hmm. um, which they do all the time, we take it from this big, huge uh, narrative of who they are as a person and we reduce it down to the absolute smallest thing we possibly can. And as we're talking about this, it's not like you're a bad kid. It is this one thing that you tried to do, it didn't work. What do you think we should do instead? Mm-hmm. And so it turns out that that process for children <laughs> works really well. It works for awesome. The, we didn't for, develop that much. For the rest of us as well. That's so true. Yeah. I think that there's so much... There's so much validity to that because when you sit down with someone, it's really easy to place blame on them of like, I did what you said, but you didn't do what you said you were going to do. And that, again, doesn't create that relationship of trust. And it goes right back to the beginning of where we started. Exactly, exactly. So if you come in as the accuser of you didn't do anything you said you were going to do, then that creates zero headway for either of you. But if you come in, I think like what we've been talking about is like coming in as a learner, like Hey, if you come into it being like, hey, this didn't seem like it was the right thing. We weren't really attached to it. Like, what have you been attached to? Like, what did you see wasn't working? And so same thing where it's like I start back with the five whys. Like, hey, why do you think that that failed? Mm -hmm. Why do you think that this wasn't the right thing? Okay, what could we do differently this time? Yeah. And just constantly coming in. I tell people most of the time, like, hey, I want to be your teammate. I want to be the guide. If I have to be your principal, I can, but I'd rather reside here. Yeah. And so most of the time, if I can come into that conversation, even if they have done zero things that we have talked about, coming into that being like, hey, walk me through why that is. There's usually, again, another story there Mm -hmm. of, okay, now there were these expectations that I felt like I had to do or whatever it was. And so constantly coming in with that, hey, I've got something to learn here, also keeps it from being this regurgitated thing that we hate after five years. Yeah. And if we can come in and be like, oh, man, everyone's motivated by a different thing, and I get to figure that out and then use that to help them, and then the next person's going to be totally different, that's what makes coaching fun. And yeah. that's what makes you stick around for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, in the spirit of, of curiosity. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you, you bring up a good point. At some at some point, any great guide does have to say, "Let's go, mm-hmm. come on." But, it, but it's usually not, "Come on, you piece of shit!" Right? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it, You're the worst because you it's, didn't. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's, just, it's just enough. <laughs> yeah. This has been awesome. So much fun. Thank you for the way you approach coaching. Thank you for sharing those stories and and I would even say like your expertise around this subject and I want to finish by saying if there's someone that's listening to this and you have well not if we know you've dealt with this uh <laughs> we don't claim to be experts even though I use that word mm-hmm. we just have identified that this is real mm-hmm. and so if that's you reach out to us uh, this is obviously something that we're passionate about, it's something that we want to talk about. I couldn't care less if you subscribe to this, but we're on this crusade where these are the things that we want to talk about. Mm-hmm. So I leave that as as our, our call to action. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Absolutely. Great to be here.